Atheist Nomads, episode 378, Recovering from Religion. The podcast you're about to listen to includes cursing and talking about hoo-hahs. Please be advised. Welcome to another episode of Atheist Nomads. I am Dustin, and in a little bit I'll be joined by Rob Palmer from Recovering from Religion and the Gorilla Skeptics on Wikipedia. And the... We, we had one news story that we talked about last week that got feedback and uh we don't get a whole lot of feedback (laughs) and uh often not specifically about a specific story so i'm gonna go ahead and just start off with that feedback uh it was from fred um feedback in episode 377 the greatest appointment first i want to congratulate you on getting me to stop what i was doing and write this reply to you i listened to 30 plus podcasts and almost never stopped to reply back to any of them hello dustin and lauren I'm a recovering Catholic for 30 years now, and at one point was listening to Catholic podcasts, which will remain nameless, where the host says that he hates the secular atheist hive mind because they all think alike. That podcast host goes on to say that everyone should be a well-balanced Catholic, where all opinions are based in logic. But this got me thinking, how many well-balanced Catholic would there be pro-life, and how many are pro-choice? How many would be for or against same-sex marriage? What about the death penalty? The answer I came up with was, zero and a hundred percent to each of these i'm sure if you call yourself well-balanced catholic and disagree with the host he would say that you are not a well-balanced catholic and your opinion is wrong so being this well-balanced catholic would literally mean you would be part of a hive mind that thinks alike which the catholic podcast host hates so much okay so i'm going to cut in uh and talk about that respond to that part before we get to the rest uh yeah, this is one of those that is kind of kind of a crazy one. Yeah, you look at pro-life Catholicism is very general pro-life. It is anti-abortion, anti-death penalty, and no sex outside of marriage to make babies, which is bizarre combination of things, uh, especially when you compare it to modern evangelicals that are pro-death penalty anti-abortion, and also against, not necessarily against any sex that is not to make babies, but against any sex that isn't between two people of the opposite sex. Uh, Ideally, more of them would want to make sure those are both consenting adults, and reasonably you shouldn't care if they're consenting adults, whatever whatever the hell they're doing. And with the pro-life and pro-choice stuff too, it's like, in all practicality, if you think we should be executing people, but you are you think the state needs to stop women from getting abortions, then shouldn't you also be really in favor of generous welfare benefits, especially to single moms? But we don't see a lot of that from the right. And some Catholics, yes, but not all Catholics support strong welfare programs. And it's, it's ridiculous how that all all works out and especially when you consider the the way some catholic hospitals are refusing to take care of pregnancies that are spontaneously ending you know miscarriages that are in process and some women are dying because they refuse to address the issue because they're pro-life so much that they can't get rid of a dying fetus to save the mom how is that pro-life? It's it's weird. It's crazy. Yeah. All right. So back to the, the feedback that Fred wrote in. Um, the reason for this feedback is about the disagreement the two of you had during the episode about the French teacher showing Im- images of Muhammad. It's refreshing to hear two people, both atheists, both hosts of the same podcast, to have opposite opinions on the subject. And if being part of a hive mind is bad, I can rest knowing that I'm not part of one. With all that said, Lauren is right. The French teacher could have taught the free speech class without the need to show the images of Muhammad. Also, has anyone ever taken an official picture or painting of Muhammad? How would the student know if the teacher showed him an image of Muhammad? This is a rhetorical question. And, P.S. Lauren is wrong. Your commentary on news is my favorite part of your show, followed by Dustin off the degree, in my opinion. <laughs> Uh, yes. Thanks for for that feedback. Um, I would have expected that if anybody would written in responding to that, any, any listeners writing in, in response to, to that, that it would have been against Lauren's side of it, not against mine. Uh, because the assumption is that all atheists are pro blasphemous speech and anti 
protecting religious sentiments when that's not true of all atheists. And, you know, some of the, the, the direction I was, and it was one of those conversations that when I put that show in the show notes to talk about, when I put that story in the show notes to talk about, I had a completely different idea of where the conversation was going than where it went. That's one of the reasons why it is, why I like to not be doing this alone is the chance of it not necessarily being the conversation that I would think it would be. Getting additional point of views and a more interesting discussion and a viewpoint that I wouldn't have even really given much consideration to. Now, it is interesting that <laughs> and then when you look at the news since then, um, the French government is on my side and the Turkish government is on Lauren's side. That feels weird and probably a little wrong. Uh, but one thing I think would be an interesting way of thinking about this is, and it fits with some of our, you know, the stuff we go through in the U.S. with the anti-abortion debate, the same-sex marriage debate, and the like, is how much, you know, when you have extremists in your country, and France has a serious problem with Muslim extremists, should you be trying to make sure you don't set them off, knowing that pushing their buttons increases the chances of radicalizing people? Uh, it is one of the things we have seen with the Black Lives Matter movement is a radicalizing of white, moderately racist, but generally quietly racist people to being militantly white supremacist. And I think everybody would assume it's would agree that it's better to have people be quietly and privately racist than militant white supremacists on the streets with assault rifles, just like everybody would think it's better for Muslims to be moderate and keep their cultural offense to themselves rather than beheading people and shooting up cartoonists. But if you let extremists keep you from trying to get progress and say what you need to say, they're still winning. But if you push too hard, you radicalize them. But is there a middle ground that actually works? And I don't know the answer to that. Uh, but I think it is uh, uh, it is something we should probably all be thinking about when we were looking at some of this news is, are you being so right that you're radicalizing the people that are wrong? And is that good? And is there anything you could do to get your point across, push for what you're pushing for and not radicalize assholes? And I don't know the answer to that. Well, it's now time for the interview. We are now joined by Rob Palmer from the Recovering from Religion Foundation, Guerrilla Skeptics on Wikipedia, and a writer on all things skeptic, who is also known as the well-known skeptic. Rob, welcome to Atheist well, Nomads. Hello, hello. Thank you very much for having me on. All right, so let's start off with the projects, the main projects you're working on. Um, so let's start off with Recovering from Religion. Uh, What's since it's been a few years since we've talked about that organization on the show, um, could you give us a, a brief overview of what Recovering from Religion is and what it does? Um, yeah, certainly. So it was founded um, in 2009 by a psychologist uh, named Dr. Dower Ray. And uh, the goal is I can actually read this from somewhere. I didn't find this on the main site, but this is what uh, this is our goal to provide hope, healing and support for people struggling with issues of doubt and non-belief. So that's it in a nutshell. Okay. So basically, we have all ways of supporting people who are having issues like that. Um, and we meet people where they are. Sometimes theists um, blame us for trying to deconvert people. You know, they claim that's what we're here for, and we don't do that. Um, I've actually you know, helped people find other religions if they weren't in the right one, according to what they were talking about, if that's what they wanted to do. Oh. Mostly, we do get people who are new atheists or struggling with some you know issue regarding religion because they don't believe anymore and that's that's the predominant number of people that we do help and and we do this sort of thing with uh several projects we can talk about you know any role if you like we have we have a helpline where people can call in mm -hmm. um we have four numbers in uh, different countries in the world and you can really call us from anywhere using the website um, we also have a chat line also from the website so people can text into us. Um, we have meetup groups, meetup.com, and we have, I think it's 50-something groups across the United States and some in other countries. We have an online community. 
kind of like a subreddit, except it's a private thing. It's not on Reddit. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a separate app we have. We do weekly presentations on subjects that are, are interest to, uh, you know, issues of people with issues of doubt or non-belief struggling with religious things. And uh, we're connected to the Secular Therapy Project, which is an you know, actual uh, trained therapist to help people who don't want to sit down with a therapist who says, uh, you know, sit, let's pray to Jesus and that'll help your marriage. <laughs> Yeah, and and what's, what's kind of interesting is is every time we have somebody from recovering from religion on, there's something new going on. Uh, I, I think the last time uh, it was the the hotline had just been launched. And oh, okay, so that chat. was yeah, that was back in 2015, if I'm remembering that correctly. So yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so then, uh, what what part of the organization are? Because that that is a lot of things that. Recovering from Religion now covers. Um, what part of it yeah. are you most actively involved in? And when I left off the podcast, we, we've had a podcast for a good number of years. It's had several incarnations with different hosts. Right now, it's on a hiatus again, but okay. it's still up there for anyone to actually look into if you want to find it. It's Recovering from Religion on you know your podcast app. Um, so I've been actually involved with quite a, a few things. I joined uh, the only silver lining in my life from the pa pandemic is that um, I re retired from my actual job early and I had some extra time, although I was already volunteering with other things, uh, not connected to my, uh, you know, main career. But I had some extra time and I'd always listened to shows that talked about recovering from religion. I thought, hey, if I had extra time, I'd love to volunteer. So I did. This was early April. It took about two, three weeks to go through training. So I immediately became a helpline volunteer, taking uh, the chats and phone calls. And then I also decided to get involved with the online community. So I'm a moderator for several of the channels. We can talk about what that is later. I'm also a social host for our RFRX sessions, which we do every Monday uh, via Zoom with anyone who wants to uh, you know, uh, zoom into them. And I recently became an ambassador, which is why I'm talking to you. So we okay. went through a little more training in order to make sure that we knew enough about the organization to represent it um, either live, well, when the pandemic is over, we'll be doing that again, tabling at like, you know, social events, mm -hmm. uh, parades or whatever, community fairs. And right now, since we can't do that, you know, I'm reaching out to, to YouTubers and podcasters to try to get the word out that way. And uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's a fairly new program, but we're trying to take the pressure off Dr. Ray and the executive director, Gail Jordan, from being the only two people who can go out and talk about the organization. <laughs> All right. That sounds, sounds like it'll be good for them. Uh... So with uh, the hotline, that's that's definitely an, an interesting one. Uh, so when you're you're manning that, how long do you are are you you on the phone? So when, my understanding, I've only been, as I said, you know, since the early part of this year. So I can only speak to the history of this from what I've heard from other people. But what I have heard from other people is that when they started it, they tried to do it in a more regimented fashion that people would sign up for time slots. Mm -hmm. You know, guarantee you'd be on the computer waiting for calls to come in for whatever for two, three hours. I don't know what, you know, what, what the shifts they picked were, but that wasn't working very well. And I guess it's hard to do that with volunteers. Right. And um, so what we do now, there was some transition and it probably helped that we have a lot more people than we did when it first started is that people just do it at their whim. So you set the application to ping you if a call comes in or a chat comes in. And if you're free, you answer it. Uh, there, okay. There's nobody, you don't have to sit at a computer and wait. Um, it, it, and it seems to be working much better this way. All right. And how often, like, what's the call volume look like? Ah, I thought you might ask that. So I actually, <laughs> went and I went to the records and I looked it up. So um, I'll give you the last four months. And this is calls and chats together. And these are some of them. We make reports if if a chat comes in and we don't get it in time or the person hangs up. So that would be included here, but that's a, a, a minority. So generally, calls and chats together for June, July, August, and September were about 260, about 380, about 310, and about 300. Okay. That's a, that's a decent amount. <laughs> yeah. And, and the agents handling those, there are 60 people signed up to take calls and 210 for chats right now. Oh, wow. And that's, that's a, the that's total that I think I was able to ascertain by looking at the different numbers and the different teams is about 400 agents total. Oh, wow. <laughs> that's, uh, that's an impressively large group. 
Yeah. But if anyone is listening who thinks they'd like to support it from what you've heard here or, you know, this talked about elsewhere, like on the Atheist Experience, Talk Heathen or wherever else, we can always use more people. We're still not getting all the calls. Uh, we're still not getting all the chats. Sometimes people just aren't available, um, you know, based on what the time zones are, especially if you're listening to this in another country. That would be fantastic. We have agents all around the world. Um, but you know, not in every country, not in every time zone. We have a lot of people in, in the UK, I believe, in Australia. But, you know, middle of Europe is a little rough. There's, there's no one in the, in the central part of Asian time zones, that sort of thing. Okay. Uh, America, as you would expect, since it's a, you know, this, age, this organization started in the U.S., is, is the predominant number of our agents come from the U.S. All right. And uh, what's, the, what, what's the most common type of, of call that you get? So, um, yeah, I'm not doing this from data, just from personal memory. So, you know, take that with a grain of salt. It's anecdotal. But I, I, w I would put them into two, two or three large groups. One is people who have just either come out of a religion, realize they don't think they believe anymore, or maybe they're sure they don't believe, but they still want confirmation. And sometimes it's the uh, Pascal's wager problem, right, in their own head. What if mm -hmm. I'm wrong here? Uh, I'm going to go to hell. You know, maybe it's Satan deceiving me. Uh, try, you know, try to help me, give me some resources so I can deal with this better, that sort of thing. Um, and, and an entirely uh, separate set. Well, I guess there could be some overlap, but it, it's the people who call. I don't know what to do now. You know, my wife and I were both in X religion and we we're both religious and we got married and now I don't believe anymore. And she still does. Or I raised my kids religious and now they're teenagers. And what do I do? Because I don't believe. How do I stop? You know, how do I help them along or even deal with them? Because they don't want to talk to me anymore. Mm. That's the, that sort of thing. And then there's a, there's a third group. I would say it's a, it's a smaller number, but not insignificant, which are women which are struggling with the misogyny from their religion. Hmm. Yeah, and the first two <laughs> really make a lot of sense. That third one shouldn't be surprising uh, when you consider how misogynistic religion is and also in modern Christianity, how heavily female it is in terms of membership and attendance. Yeah, interestingly, uh, I would say I've had an equal number of people come out of uh, Islam talking about this issue. Uh, hmm. And that's, you know, it's much worse there, I would think. Yeah. But also, yes, Christians and people from sort of vanilla uh, Christian religions, as well as fundamental Christian religions that either have just been fed up with their particular pastor, uh, you know, or, or generally all of a sudden because they're having doubts now realize why was I putting myself through this? And it's nonsense. Yeah. Yeah. That makes, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and then and when we get calls from people of all different ages, which always astounds me too. Um, you know, I feel I had an 80 something year old person almost crying that they wasted their whole life in religion and, and that, you know, they're just realizing this. Uh, Oh. And, you know, it's, that's kind of hard to deal with. But I also had a 15-year-old girl with the same, I'm, I've am i wasted my life. That was like almost funny. You're 15. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you got smart quick. You know, consider yourself lucky. But, I didn't yeah. but, you know, to her, it was serious. She was uh, in a Christian school and all of her friends were Christian. Her family were fundamentalist and she can't talk to anybody. So we're very happy she found us. Yeah. Huh. Um, and then after people call... And you, you talk to them, what's, what's kind of the, the next step? Is there some kind of a handoff? Or... Well, so, so one of the things we do is, is, as I said, we don't try to deconvert people. I mean, you know, if people are, are questioning and they want answers to what do atheists think about this, I'm always a little cautious with that because I don't want to give my personal opinion. I'll say this is general one I've heard, but, you know, the answer to, you know, uh, one question is what atheism is. All well, atheists don't think alike on anything, mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, get through that. Uh, but generally what we're there to do is to provide them with, you know, emotional support and also resources. So we have a, a large group at RFR where their job is to put together vetted resources that we can suggest to people like this. Um, so, so they're all available from our main uh, website. And, you know, there's a little button that says resources. And from there, you click down and it breaks up, you know, what are you struggling with? What type of issue is it? And then it brings you to a page with resources that hopefully will help if you, they could be books, so you could read them. 
online articles, they could be YouTube videos, they could be podcasts we're suggesting. And, and the, the team that puts these together, you know, someone might suggest something and that we can't just put it up on the web. They have to vet it. So they'll, they'll listen to several or maybe a lot of like, say, YouTube broadcasts from a person before they can trust them enough to put that as a suggestion of a certain thing. Um, we're also allowed to give our own, you know, dependent um, opinion. So like I've been listening to several YouTubers for a long time, uh, also some podcasts. So I will suggest those to the people. Hey. You know, and most of them, surprisingly, have never heard of the ones that are common to all of us. You don't know the thinking atheist. You don't know the atheist experience, you know, <laughs> that sort of thing. Okay, I got something for you to listen to. And, th and then a third thing is, especially for them to deal better with the people in their lives that are still religious, is street epistemology. I don't know if you guys have covered that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have. Have you, co have you covered that topic? Yep. Okay, so yeah, that's the Anthony Magnabosco thing about the proper way to have conversations that aren't off-putting. And, uh, you know, we, we give people that resource as well. All right. So, so the other thing we might do, by the way, is after that, if, if it's somebody who's looking for a community, we'll then also point them at either the, uh, I, I mentioned that we have meetup groups. So mm -hmm. we'll, we'll tell them how to, how to find those groups. And the other thing is that we have our online community, which is, is a fairly new thing also. So... That, that's something that if someone's looking for someone to talk to about their problems on an ongoing basis, and this would be peer support, other clients, as well as agents, we, we chime in occasionally, but it's mostly a peer-to-peer -peer support thing. We'll tell them about that and send them an invitation. You can't find this on the web. It's extremely private. We have to vet the person by a phone call or a chat to make sure they're not uh, you know, I don't know, William Lane Craig trying to convert people back to religion. Mm -hmm. You know, we want to make sure it's really people who are, who are seeking help or, or camaraderie. And then we'll send them an invitation and tell them how to join that group. All right. Yeah, there's 22 channels, which is kind of cool. They oh, run the oh, gamut wow. from, you know, all sorts of ex-religions, ex-Mormon, ex-Muslim, ex ex-Catholic, um, to... You know, subjects of, of particular interest to subgroups of people. There's an LBGTQ one. There's a black non-believers. There's family family issues. There's one specifically for women. Those those sorts of things. So I think there's 22 or so channels at this point. All right. And what's the the how active are those communities? Uh, they're all different. It does depend. Um, I, I'm actually the moderator of the Catholic one, and I've been trying to get. You know, uh, conversations going for a, a few it comes along and then it just goes nowhere i guess you know the people are happy with looking at just a general channel it's a general channel which is pretty active that one doesn't have a specific topic it's just anyone can talk right. to anyone else and everyone goes into that one first and then you get to look at and to the uh descriptions of the other ones and ask please invite me to those if it's you know if it's pertinent to you okay and yeah for for a lot of of different like religious groups it's not too hard like it's not hard to be an ex-catholic in the u.s yeah oh, yeah yeah i agree with that there's there's tons of, of be, being an ex-catholic Catholic, by the way being okay an yeah. yeah yeah no, that, i had almost no common. trauma coming out yeah I, and, and that's that's by the way an interesting thing a lot of our helpline agents have had uh rts so it's not an official psychological diagnosis but it's certainly a subset of PTSD, as we go, religious trauma syndrome. You know, there, there are people who have come out of fundamental religions. Maybe just uh, we have we have one who's going to a Mormon university. He's in a senior year, and you now he realizes he's an atheist, and he can't say a damn thing because they'll throw him out. Mm -hmm. uh, but he's one of our most active people. It's amazing. Um, <laughs> but you know, but his family doesn't know. No one in his personal life knows. So yeah, we have people like that. A lot of Jehovah's Witnesses, ex Mormons. Pentecostal Christians, where it's been, you know, hell for them to get out of their religion, and they were psychologically damaged in some way because of being in it. Yeah, and and with some of those groups, it's the often you're fine while you're in it. Trying to leave is absolutely brutal. Yeah, trying to yep, adapt to their normal that's, world. <laughs> that's absolutely true. Yeah, and and so as I mentioned, by calling and or chatting, and like we can invite people to that community, and that also gives them insight into the other thing I mentioned, which is we call it the RFRX talks. I think it's a takeoff on like TEDx mm -hmm. talks. Um, every Monday, eight o'clock Eastern time, we have somebody giving a presentation, and then followed by a Q and A on some subject that would be of interest to people struggling with religious issues or or you know post religious tra trauma. Um, we, we've had topics that ranged from 
oh, let's see, grief without God, sexuality, uh, you know, finding meaning without God, um, you know, dealing with kids. Uh, we had we had Dave Warnock give a presentation, dying out loud. Um, those those sorts of things. Uh, and so being in our community, we although we advertise this other places. But it's kind of, you know, hit and miss. But if you're in our online community, hey, you'll see it announced every week when who the next speaker is and what the, what the story is. And on their own, they're kind of nice. This is another slight silver lining of the pandemic. Because the meetup groups weren't able to meet, they, just started, they decided to start these. And you know, it's been such a hit. I don't think they'll, they'll ever stop it, even if, you know, COVID goes totally away. Um, it's, it's every week we get a professional and we talk about it. And then the really wonderful thing is, uh, Dustin, is afterwards, because there are video Zoom sessions, you know, we have like up mm -hmm. to 100 people who can then ch video chat with each other for hours and hours. I've been the, mod the uh, host, <laughs> which is, it's gone four or five hours after the speaker was done oh, with wow. people just talking about, you know, what, what the presentation was about, but then just going into all sorts of issues. Very cool. Yeah. Well, and heck, if you go to any atheist meetup it's you've got a decent roughly equal chances of talking about science fiction or linux or cars or sports <laughs> or anything else by the time you're four hours and six drinks yeah, in absolutely <laughs> okay so then COVID, has covid really had any other effects other than um causing the, the the meetups to go on hiatus well so uh i neglected to mention besides the the meetups that are like ha led by individuals in different cities um we did start a virtual one which will so all of those are virtual now too mm -hmm. right so actually if you go to our main page and say find a group near us even if there wasn't isn't one right near you you can join anyone and you know because they're all meeting virtually probably through zoom so that's fine but at some point they're probably going to go back to meeting in person Hopefully not too far in the distant future, although not right, not right before the election, as some people are saying. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, so um, but we, we've started a virtual one, which will remain, you know, even if the situation totally clears up and, and those other ones all go away, we'll have a virtual one. So you can, you know, attend that meetup no matter where you are in the country or, in fact, in the world. Um, yeah. So, so that's really, uh, I think that's going to be helpful. And that, I would suspect that would stay pretty popular with uh a lot of people not living where there's a, a physical meetup yeah yeah so 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 besides r x starting and that starting uh and maybe we've had more volunteers because like me they had more time on their hands to do something with covid you know i, I think that's been pretty much the only impact uh well as i mentioned we also can't go to like you know uh you know uh any kind of places where we can advertise rfr in person right yeah no. All right. And, uh, did I mention the podcast? Yeah. I said the podcast. You did. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh, and how about the secular therapy project? Have you guys talked about that? Uh, we had last time we had Daryl Ray on was talking about secular therapy project. Um, that's still, but that's still going. That's still going. It's growing strong. It's had, you know, we, we were adding therapists all the time. And, and so for people who haven't heard that the, the, this is sort of, um, I don't know what you would call it, but it's it's sort of like a match a matchup uh, a matchup group for us to get people who are clients looking for therapy without any religious overtones to match them up with therapists who act that way and make you know to make sure that they don't have a, a religious person uh, doing therapy with them who's going to try to inject their their own religious beliefs into it and so that's also available from our main site it says seek professional help and what you do is you log in as a client and then it, it shows you in your zip code the uh therapists that are available and again for the short term anyway that probably doesn't even matter as long as it's in your own state and your insurance you know covers them they're 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 taking your insurance mm -hmm. uh, i know therapists are, are only can usually see people in their own state based upon their insurance. So that way you can just, you know, contact that. And we don't take any money for that. It's, it's just a service we provide to meet, to, to get the people together who want that kind of therapy with therapists who give that kind of therapy. And by the way, well, why can't a therapist just advertise that they're, you know, an atheist therapist? Because then they're going to lose all their uh, religious <laughs> clients. You I mean, even if they don't ever, it doesn't mm -hmm. come up. A lot of people will not like it if they see their therapist you know, announcing that they're atheists, they're they're going to stop going to them. So this is a yeah, this is a way to to do this kind of on on the down low for therapists who like to give that kind of therapy but don't want to advertise that way and lose a lot of their other clientele. Right, because 
a therapist providing science-based uh, psychological help to a Christian, that's not bad therapy for a Christian. Right. Okay. Well, it's, it's, we think it's the only good therapy. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but most Christians aren't going to have a problem with the style of therapy until they exactly. find out, oh, no, you're, you're a dirty atheist that's going to try to use right. this. Right, who to actually get advertises head. to get other atheists, and here's clients. Yeah, yeah they'll get inside yeah. my head and, and yeah. try and take my religion away. <laughs> you're going to try to deconvert me here. I don't want that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. So, uh, and then... Do you, do you have a therapist in every state at this point? Do you know? Hmm, that's a good question. I do think so, but I can't say for sure. At least I haven't most seen states. that list in a while. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. yeah. I haven't had anybody who called in and tried to get one and said, no, there's nobody near me. So that's good. Oh, that is nice. Yeah. And uh, with the podcast, um, who's, who's hosting that now? Oh, so actually it is at least temporarily on hiatus. Um, the... I think there were two incarnations and actually maybe in fact three and in each time the the people who were doing it and my understanding is they basically got busy with their other lives and let it go and that just has happened again so i think they're debating okay. whether or not to start it up again but it's been such a long time uh since that the other one started that i'm, I'm hearing some like some mussings that maybe it's not necessary because there are so many other atheist podcasts now compared to when that started, if you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. All right. And... Yeah. But there's a whole slew of them there in the backlog, you know, with all the descriptions of what they talk about. So it's certainly still helpful for a lot of people to have, to have that resource. Well, and I'd, I'd imagine that'd be much more of a uh, timeless show than uh, a show like yeah. mine. That's mostly news. Yeah, well, yeah, you do you do talk about, you know, what's going on and that's uh, you know, a different type of a thing. That that is yeah. true. All right. And then you also work with Gorilla Skeptics on Wikipedia. Yeah, have you ever had anyone talk about that? Uh yes, we have. Yes, we've had Susan on. Oh, fantastic. Um that probably was around twenty fourteen or twenty fifteen. <laughs> Okay, so also a while ago. So yeah. I can give a little synopsis of that for people who mm-hmm. didn't uh, hear that former one. So yeah, this is actually the thing that got me into the whole skeptical movement and uh, being an activist for anything, in fact. Uh, In 2012 or 13, I I found out about podcasting, started listening to them. I found out that there was, in fact, a skeptical movement. Um, Didn't know that my entire life. Uh, And then I started hearing Susan and some other people from her team being interviewed on podcasts. Might have been one of yours. I don't know. But yeah. And I said, wow, that's intriguing. If I had some time, I would do that. And then I wound up thinking, well, you know, I don't have to spend a lot of time on it. So let me do it right now. And uh, it was about 20, late 15 or early 16, I contacted her, as I recall. And went through that training, and uh, I've been on the team since then. And it, it's it's quite it's quite an amazing project. Yeah. All right. So Susan was on Atheist Nomads episode twenty seven, okay, May seventeen, twenty thirteen. Oh, what number are we up to now? Uh, this is three seventy. Wow. Okay. Eight. I think that's not hard for me to Go find. So, so Susan yeah, is, is the Susan is the founder of the organization, and she's still directs it and personally does all the training and loves to do that uh yeah we, you know, we've tried to get her to uh, farm some of that out but she just loves doing it so that's what yeah. she does um we so our our goal is to uh battle uh nonsensical thinking on wikipedia and uh, to promote science and reason so we work as a team to improve the science and skeptical content of articles where that's appropriate and to remove uh, claims that are, you know, not uh, founded in reality, mm-hmm. having to do with alt medicine, uh, conspiracies like anti-vaccination, um, you know, that flat Earth, uh, that that sort of thing. We write new articles for people who are in the skeptical and uh, atheist movement. We wrote Seth Andrews' page and Matt Dillahunty's, as a matter of fact, uh, and also for their organizations. Um, we um, you know, we monitor those pages to make sure there's not vandalism on them and update them as necessary. Every time there's a conference or co- convention, we'll make sure that that page is up to date with the speakers list, that sort of a thing. Okay. And uh, it, it's amazing the impact this organization has. Yeah. So then that's a, a large, uh, large spread on, on Wikipedia that you're, you're, uh, helping edit. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, and, and by the way, once you're trained, 
if, if you decide to join this team. It, it, it's very free form, much like I described RFR. It's, it's not like, you know, you have to go do this now. Mm -hmm. It's, hey, we have a Facebook group where we we're told what's going on in the world and anyone can take anything they want or you can work on whatever you want you know people have their own uh, interests and hobbies that have nothing to do with scientific skepticism or atheism and they work on those pages too and in fact that makes you a better editor mm -hmm. uh it gives you kind of credibility for the other wikipedia editors that you're not a one you know one goal in mind person because that's considered a bad thing as a matter of fact yeah um, and and, and the, the, you know to make to make an impact like we've been able to make still astounds me so for personally i've been doing this since 2016 i've written from scratch about 20 articles um well scratch or i like basically there was a few paragraphs there and i've blown it up into a nice article so we track for each editor the page views for that kind of work now keep in mind we don't track page views for every edit we make mm -hmm. it's impossible you might just improve the the introductory paragraph we might delete a few things we don't track those but just for that large category of thing i mentioned which is writing a new article i personally am responsible for 5.3 million page views since wow. 2016 yeah and it's 33,000 i just looked this up 33,000 a week hmm. uh yeah and and there is no way you can get that influence writing anything else frankly yeah you know i i write for a magazine you know it has a, a as a publication skeptical inquirer has a nice um, following, but still, you know, not not anything like those those numbers. And I looked this up once. If you if you write a nonfiction book and publish it, the average for a nonfiction book sales in its lifetime of many publishing publications is three thousand five hundred. And as I mentioned, again, I'm getting thirty three thousand a week. <laughs> wow, that is uh... yeah. So you can either write, spend two years to write a book and get three thousand people to ever look at it, or you can do this kind of thing and have millions of people be influenced by what you write. Yeah, that's incredible. Uh, and then, so then how much of it, like, how bad have some of the pseudoscience ones been prior to you or some of your, your colleagues uh, trying to clean them up? Oh, well, so Jeanette Wilson, I'll give you a specific recent example. She's a person who claims to do psychic surgery. And this isn't the old kind when you stick your fingers into somebody or cat guts come out uh this is a new kind of thing they've invented where she's in touch with with uh deceased physicians who oh. give her the psychic power to heal people just by laying on hands and so she claims <laughs> yeah yeah so she's a um she's a psychic medium quote unquote every time i say the word psychic or medium I think there's air quotes around them uh from new zealand and uh she's also a COVID denier, it's a hoax, uh, vaccine denier, although she claims not. So, uh, you know, her, her Wikipedia article has been updated by my team with all of the nonsense and all the scientific uh, criticism of her. And uh, now this is somewhat unique. This wasn't a fan who came along and tried to fix it. This was Jeanette Wilson, the person Herself. who the article was about, found the page or someone told her, made an account with her own name, which was just a stupid move, mm -hmm. because you're not allowed to edit your own article on Wikipedia. Yep. And, you know, went to the talk page. Every Wikipedia article has a talk page where editors discuss what's on the page. This is all lies. I'm taking it all off. And, of course, we didn't even have to do it. Regular editors said, you can't do that, and put it all back. And <laughs> then she did it again. You know, she repeated it. Now she's still in the process of complaining to the Wikimedia Foundation, which runs Wikipedia, that this is slander and lies and whatever. But it's not. Because it's yes, she's she's a uh, uh, she's promoting bullshit. Well, and, and if you're doing Wikipedia right, every claim you make has to have a source. Exactly right, and and, and well, part of her problem was she removed all the criticism, saying these weren't valid criticisms. There were people who were quote unquote out to get her, mm. but they were in fact from valid sources, <laughs> like uh, the Mercy Side Skeptics or the Good Thinking Society in the UK who investigated her. That sort of thing. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I've also had flat earthers, by the way, work on the uh, flat flat earth. Uh, uh, I think it's called the Flat Earth Society is the name of the article on Wikipedia, and I made a section on it about the resurgence of the flat earth beliefs in current times because mm -hmm. it had kind of died out until um, I think his name is Michael Steele came up with flat earth clues on YouTube, and yeah. now there's millions of videos on YouTube supposedly proving the earth is flat. And it's grabbed a lot of people's, uh, you know, uh, 
belief system and, and they're all in. They've gone down that rabbit hole and they're, they're sunk into that. So there was nothing on the Wikipedia article about that at all. And I added a whole section about it, giving, you know, recent skeptics who've written about the subject, like Steve Novella from the Skeptics Guide to the Universe and people like that. And somebody came along and said, you can't say this is nonsense. You have to be fair and balanced because you're an encyclopedia and took it off. You know, and then we had a very short battle and, you know, no, they lost. It's still there. <laughs> Oh man, how often do those those edits get get challenged like that? Well, so Wikipedia is much better than it was when it first started because automation has taken over. There mm -hmm. are systems in place now to to queue in editors. You can watch a page, which I have pretty much any page I've ever edited of anything significant. I watch it, and if there's a change, I get an email. Uh, so usually they don't last long. And if and if it's a, a nonsense thing, like sometimes people would just put a curse on a page for no good reason, probably to just like as a bet or to prove they could. Or in the middle of an article on some scientific matter, they'll say, you know, I, I love Jill. You know, those will be taken off instantaneously, literally a second by by a bot that mm. looks for those mm -hmm. sorts of things and just takes them off. And, the, uh, you know, in the days gone, gone by when Wikipedia started, there were no such things as that. Uh, and also the rules were a lot more lax. And I think, by the way, frankly, that's the reason why still school children are said, don't trust Wikipedia. Uh, yeah, it, they, the, the schools and stuff haven't really stayed up to date. I mean, as with any source, you need to look at what the sourcing mm -hmm. is there. Just don't believe anything on a page, but in, without looking at the original sources, which are, are referenced there. But it's, it's certainly as accurate as studies have shown now, as say Encyclopedia Britannica. Mm -hmm. And especially I would say on the pages that matter, like of science and pseudoscience and medicine, those sorts of things in history and religion, because there are a lot of people who are, have a stake in making sure they're right. Hey, if you look at a page on a newly released CD and like, you know, they have the lyrics wrong, you know, I can't vouch for that. Right. Right. But if it's something, you know, if, if it's on something on hypertension, you're going to have cardiologists yep. involved in making sure the data on there is correct. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and in fact, in Gorilla Skeptics, we usually we stay off the straight science pages because we have very few, few we do have a few, but very few people who are experts. Anyway, uh, anybody can join the Gorilla Skeptics. Susan Garbick was a baby photographer. I mean, you know, she, she, <laughs> that, that's it. All right, I'm an aerospace engineer, but I do work on the, on the space projects there, but almost everything I do has nothing to do with that at all. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's an amazing thing that this could be crowdsourced and be as accurate and helpful to the world as it is but that's that's what we have yeah very nice oh i, I think i neglected to mention as a team we're up to 71 million page views on the articles we've written <laughs> since the organization started oh wow <laughs> <laughs> yeah it, it it just blows my mind and it's like wow and of course you know they're not, they're not all individual people because some people repeatedly use wikipedia and go there, but still that many articles are read by people that uh, that we mm -hmm. worked it's amazing. And uh, you, you mentioned psychics and mediums, um, but you've done some direct uh, investigations into some before. Well, I, I've supported, yes, I've supported them. I've actually done, a, a pre I, I've done presentations on uh, the danger of believing in psychics and mediums since I got pulled into this aspect of, of uh, skepticism. And uh, it is thanks to Susan Garbick, the same person who founded the, the girl of skeptics her her other love and she's got a wikipedia page so anyone can go and read read about her career um you know she has a, a love of um you know telling the truth about people claiming to have psychic powers and especially people who claim to talk to the dead you know for people um so she's done investigations that have you know caught famous tv psychics in uh, lying and outright fraud and they've been published in places like the new york times uh and she is a writer as am i for skeptical inquirer so she writes these up and they get on the internet and become cited in wikipedia so that's fantastic because if you <laughs> go to a page for like uh thomas john or Matt Fraser, or uh, Tyler Henry, you know, like she's written tons of articles about them. Uh, like uh, Thomas John was the one who was cited in the New York Times uh, a year ago for, um, you know, fraudulently having him, himself or his people, or hey, maybe dead spirits did it, but reading faked Facebook information back to people in the audience uh, as if they were coming from their dead relatives, and you know, mm. caught red-handed 
uh, Thomas Westbrook, Holy Kool Aid, a uh, 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 YouTube channel, did a video interviewing Susan and Mark Edward, who who supported this, who were the plants in the audience using aliases and fake Facebook information that even they weren't aware of. And Thomas John, it's so embarrassing. Read them back about their dog buddy and their you know dead relatives and whatever, and and, and especially in the you could see in the Thomas Westbrook's video, he's showing the screenshots of what was put by other people, including me. Uh, on Facebook pages in order to like to see if he was going to do it and he fell for it. <laughs> nice. The sad thing is as James Randi who just passed away uh discovered going after Yuri Geller it you know it, it's great to 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 show these people for what they are but some people just won't listen and some people don't care. And Yuri Geller uh, famously his career took off after he was uh shown to be a fraud on the Tonight Show. Uh, yeah. with uh, with Geller's help. Uh, you know, it looked like it might have been the end of Yuri Geller's career. This is on Yuri Geller's Wikipedia article, by the way, as it is also on The Tonight Show and the uh, and uh, James Randi, thanks to the Grill Skeptics having documented it. <laughs> but but un- but unfortunately, like he was on other TV shows a few days after that, and, you know, Randi wasn't involved with showing him up there. And, you know, he took his career, took off. Um, so similarly, I'll give you an example of Thomas John. You know, th- this thing happened where he was shown to be reading fake Facebook accounts. None other than the New York Times published this in the magazine. How many millions of people read that? Mm-hmm. And also, oh, by the way, he had a TV show, Seatbelt Psychic, where he drives around in, a, in an Uber-like thing and picks up people and talks to them about their dead people sitting next to them in the back seat. You know, Susan also, you know, showed that that was, those were actors. They weren't just random people being picked off the street and published all of that. Within a year, he, he was the headliner at, at Caesar's Palace in Vegas, given his own show by Caesar's Palace mm. to, you know, a dinner show to uh, to the amazing Thomas John, you know, talks to your dead relatives while you while you're in the audience. Uh, it, it's despicable. And then uh, another show on TV, the Thomas John experience. Where he's driving across the country now, by the way, in the middle of the pandemic somehow and, you know, stopping at restaurants and whatever and telling, you know, Random people, supposedly, which they're not, about their dead relatives that he's in contact with. So, you know, e- even that degree of exposure yeah. did not yet sink his career. Yeah. Oh, and it's it's so much easier to do that on TV when you can more easily get your plants and control the control Absolutely. every aspect of it. Absolutely. And if anything goes wrong, it, it hits the editing room floor. You know, they yeah. show the hits and forget all the misses. Literally. Yeah. If you're sitting in an audience with them especially if they're not hot reading, which is looking at information. They're just doing cold reading, which is throwing out Barnum statements that somebody in the audience is going to match up with. Uh, yeah, but still, there's a lot of misses there. Uh, you know, things they throw out that are just plain wrong and nobody in the audience says, yeah, that's right. That, if it's on a TV show, just doesn't get shown at all. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> that's yeah. crazy. I mean, when people do it in an audience, to make up for the, even if they're not hot readers, and most people probably are not, except for maybe, you know, I'm not talking about like the Thomas John thing where they took the time before a show to go on Facebook and, and see who was going to be there. But, you know, the, the typical thing, people wait in a waiting room and they talk to each other about what they expect to to find out from their dead relatives. And there's like plants listening to all this, ready to feed it to the to the psychic or medium. Uh, that's the old fashioned way of doing it. And it still works. Or occasionally. You know, they just have a, another person in the audience that was at another reading of theirs that they already got all the yeses and nos from, and they know them, but they don't mention that. Or, you know, it could be just a plant, somebody who works for the person. In fact, at that at the Thomas John thing, which Susan wrote up and made it to the New York Times, one of the people who was getting 10 on hits in the audience was his student, who was being trained <laughs> to be a psychic. Oh, wow. Who he, he was stupid enough to reveal in the VIP meeting after the whole thing, oh, yeah, this is my student. <laughs> You mean the one that you called on and knew all about her? Surprisingly, amazingly, that you couldn't have known these things? You know her and you work with her. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. But the sad thing, Dustin, is how many people buy this and you know will not listen. I, I'm involved with Facebook groups, which, God help us, try to, well, not God help us, try to argue with people who are hook, line, and sinker defending these people that know... I'm going to tell you how you, they really do it. They don't want to hear it because they already believe in it. It's, it's sort of like a religion to them. They don't want to be talked yeah. out of it. Well, and, and it's like there's there's people who go to, to psychics thinking it's just a show. But there's a lot who are, are true believers. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I and I would say some people who go in thinking it's a show of fun and games, maybe a magic trick is done and they don't know how it's done or something is pulled out that is a bit of information that this is always said. There's no way they could have known when we know how they could have known. Mm-hmm. And that, in fact, flips a switch in that person's head where now it's not fun and games anymore and they yeah. become true believers. And yeah, so I mentioned I've, I've talked about this. I, I, I did a presentation at SciCon. Uh, some Zoom presentations to organizations, skeptic and humanist about the subject, that people's lives are ruined by the belief in psychics. Um, And I found this out when I listened to a detective being talked about on a podcast, Skepticality uh, is the podcast, and the detective is Bob Nygaard. And I said, and he's a retired New York City detective who went to Florida thinking he was never going to work again and then got pulled into psychic fraud business by helping a few clients out. And now he does that. It's been 10 more years and he does that full time. As far as we know, he's the only person who does this. I wrote him a Wikipedia article about it. And because I did that and then got a job writing for Skeptical Inquirer, I interviewed him. My work was out there with my contact information. And now I get emails from people in the saddest situations. They lost their life savings. Rob, please help me. I don't know what to do. And I give them Bob Nygaard's information because he's a detective who can help them. But he tells me he gets four or five calls like that a day. The number of people whose lives have been ruined and are being ruined is ongoing and is, is probably immeasurable because they have been suckered by these people who will take them literally for their life savings. The woman, the first woman who wrote me was $42,000, and that's all she had. And it, the numbers are up to, I think the largest number was $12 million from one person who was a Hollywood Whoa. producer or something. Uh, but, you know, largely in between hundreds of hundreds of thousands of dollars, people bankrupt themselves by like, taking mortgages out and giving the psychic all the money. Um, yeah, if you just go to Bob Nygaard's page, many of those high profile, like large dollar cases I've put on there so people can see what the kind of thing that goes on. It, it's distressing. And the legal system is not on the victim side. No, no, it's you would think that it would be fall under the numerous fraud laws. Yep. Yep. But but it's weird because like uh, what Bob Nygar told me is people go to the police precinct and, you know, they, 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 what happened? And they describe it. They say, well, gave her all that money. What are you stupid? No one put a gun to your head. Why'd you do that? Yeah, it, it's astounding. But yes, technically it is for. And in fact, in New York City, there's a law that's been on the books since 60s or 70s that it's it's against the law to pretend to have psychic powers. And yet, like every street corner has a psychic. How, how does that, how is that jive? <laughs> I mean, you know, it's not a bit, I think the penalty was like uh, $5,000, which is clearly nothing. But 90 days in jail, that's not bad if you actually did it. But the police don't, don't do anything. They don't implement it. Yeah. And, and probably many jurisdictions don't have any laws at all. And by the way, a lot of ways you can get around these because it's a fine print. You know, if you say it's for entertainment purposes, that's okay. Mm-hmm. Which is, you know, that's okay for someone who says they're a mentalist and they're doing a show or something. But that's, they, they'll have a little sign in their window. This is, you know, tiniest of print. This is for, even when they do it on the internet, you know, the, the, you click five clicks in and you'll find a page that says this is for entertainment purposes only. But that's ignored because no one reads that or cares. Right. So, so now let me bring up a high profile name, Gwyneth Paltrow. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, She had a show on Netflix called The Goop Lab, which is going to have a second incarnation. I actually interviewed the the, the detective I was talking about. Uh, Its last episode, it had six episodes. In the last episode, Gwyneth spent the entire episode basically deceiving people into her personal psychic was real. And that, in fact, everyone has psychic powers and psychic powers are real. The damage that she did Mm. to, you know, people's belief in this is, is probably uncountable and you know she's not held accountable netflix it's a you know it's a netflix series they don't care because they got the ratings mm-hmm. it's it's just atrocious she she there's a there's a medium called anthony william he calls himself the medical medium his best-selling books about how to cure cancer and stuff by drinking stuff like celery juice and gwyneth mm-hmm. paltrow you know calls him the most influential amazing hero healer in the world how do they get away with this? Why is this not medical malpractice? Because somewhere on the website, it says it's for entertainment purposes only. Yeah. And, and if, he, if anybody were to push it hard enough, then they'd switch from its entertainment purposes to it's a religion. Yep. Sadly true. Because televangelists also take thousands to millions of dollars from people. Sadly true. Oh, man. That's... You would think we would have better fraud laws than that, 
But yeah, I, every time one of these big things posts, people ask, "Why well, don't we?" And I, I just don't know. I don't know. So, oh, and, and so I mentioned the problem when you go to a police precinct. So now even if you do get a police officer there to take it seriously, now you get to the next hurdle, which is, you know, the justice system. Uh, you know, prosecutors have so much, so much business. Uh, are they going to take, you know, because you gave your money to a client without a gun to your head, quote unquote, are they going to take your, your, your thing to prosecute it? Uh, even if they think that's that's legit, maybe they don't think they can convince an you know, a, 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 a jury that you weren't just stupid and you deserve to have lost the money. Uh, so they're always making those decisions. And then even if you get somebody who's willing to take it, a lot of times what Bob Nigar tells me is that they will go after the, uh, have, have the, the, the medium psychic arrested. And if they give the money back, they just drop all charges. Well, like, what good does that do in the long run? Yeah, because then the oh man. Yeah, it's oh. like it's like if you were shoplifting and came out of Walmart with like you know I don't know a boatload of jewelry under you, and oh we got you, just give it back and you can go on your way. Yeah, no, it doesn't work that way because you're just going to go into the next Walmart. It, or if it, you but, steal a car and you just give it back. Yeah, yeah, the car thing is an interesting example because Nygaard said he's used this on a lot of uh, of precincts who don't want to prosecute because it's 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 fraud or 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 because the client that the victim was quote unquote stupid right well you might be stupid if you like say leave your car running in what you think is a safe neighborhood and pull up to a 7-eleven and run in for a quick pack of cigarettes or coffee mm -hmm. uh, and come out and your car's gone because a bunch of teenagers stole it but they are still going to be prosecuted for grand theft auto yeah right right and 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 no police precinct would say oh you were stupid you left your keys running in the car you know no so there's some fundamental difference in people's heads about this. Yeah, that that taking something physical without your knowledge that it's happening is different than convincing you to hand over your money. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. By but what to the other person is clearly a ridiculous reason. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah, and the other thing is, by the way, lest one think that you know only stupid people fall for these things. Nygaard's clients have been CEOs of major corporations. Medical doctors, lawyers, um, you know, it, it's astounding what the human mind can be led to believe if the person is a good enough con artist mm -hmm. and you're of a mindset to believe it. So, so yeah, let me juxtapose this with uh, the question of religion. So when I presented this at PsyCon, I had a slide up which was showing a one column out of a Pew Research poll from 2018 about Americans' belief in the paranormal. And one of the columns was belief in psychics. And it broke it down. How likely are you to believe in a psychic, depending what religion you're in? So it, they broke it up into mainstream religions. Uh, I don't remember the breakup right now, but it was maybe Catholic, you know, Protestant, that sort of thing. And then there were also some other categories like, uh, uh, let's see, spiritualist, spiritual, spiritual, uh, or atheist. Those are separate. So the average of all of them was something like 45%. So 45% of Americans, almost half, believe oh. in this nonsense. Oh, wow. Uh, and and that, that held true for almost all the religions, give or take four or five points in each one, until you get to the atheists, and it was, guess, what do you think? What do you think would be for atheists? Two or three percent? Ten, unfortunately. Oh, ten. Yeah, so, so still, so that's yeah. that's a right. So it's it's one it's it's ten percent as opposed to twenty five percent or more. Uh, I mean forty yeah. percent uh, of of religious people. You know, nearly half versus ten percent. That, that's so it's somewhat of an inoculation, not as much as I would have hoped. Well, but it okay, is. when you look at survey results, I don't know how much of it is just the way the questions are worded, but it always seems like at least ten to fifteen percent are completely counterintuitive mm. on any of the or, results. Or, 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 or that many results. will believe in anything. Yes. Yeah. Gi yeah. It's the question: giant reptilians from the planet Sauron run the government. Ten percent will say yeah. <laughs> That's probably yeah. true. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it, it's like, how do women of color support Trump? Yeah. Yeah. Some do. Yeah. Don't get how. Yeah. yeah, there were people at his rally outside the White House right when he was released from the hospital. I remember that, yeah. Yeah. Way more diverse than, you know, the white men that he likes. Yeah. So, oh, oh, so the one other category of people, this might be of interest, in that survey were the people who consider themselves spiritual but not religious. Mm -hmm. Guess on that one. I'm going to say 65%. Very good. Very close to this. Something like that. Yep. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, so that's a shame. People might come out of mainstream religion and believe in this crap more. Well, some of the people that are spiritual but not religious are the people who just, they grew up in kind of a hippy dippy spiritual household. So yep. it's what they grew up with. Yep. Yep. I think that's true. And yeah, that's, uh, yeah, not. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so Bob Nygaard had one quote, by the way, I did ask him this when I interviewed him for Skeptical Inquirer magazine, uh, have, you know, have you ever had an atheist client? And he said, in fact, no, hmm. uh, he said, you know, he's not going to say that can happen that one would get defrauded. Clearly it can, if it's like about 10%, I believe, but yeah. you know, of all the huge numbers he's had, no, he's never had. Hmm. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the fact that he's. You you mentioned some of the the higher value uh, cases he's dealt with were in the millions. Uh, yeah, obvious. Yeah, it's, it's, very, it's it's very sad. Yeah, the, the, the one, one one recent one that made a lot of uh, news. I mean, the larger the the draw, you know, you lose you lose fifty thousand dollars. Like it's not going to make the newspaper anywhere. You lose you know a few hundred thousand or million dollars, and somebody might make notice of it. It might even make national news. So this one was like seven million dollars. You know that made news, and then there was. <laughs> And sometimes the circumstances are odd enough that they'll just make news. So here's one I recall. Um, ugh, this is a you know a really sad case. Uh, a, a client who was a male uh, went to the psychic and said he was in love with someone on Facebook, but she wouldn't give him the time of day. You know, the psychic said, "You have bad bad energy, bad vibes. I can fix it for you." It was you know hundreds of thousand dollars over years. Oh, the relationship's getting better. He kept working with her, and then the person he fell in love with, which I think her name was Michelle, died. Mm. Oh, so he you know goes to the psychic oh you know i'm not asking for my money back i know you were trying it's not your fault she died and and the psychic convinces him to not give up she can reincarnate her soul into another person's body for him. and it went on for much longer oh oh wow yeah the psychic had a mark yep and didn't want to let, let him go, go. Yeah. And then there's, the, there's the, 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 you know, this shows you how the religion comes into it. There was another client, and actually, I'm not sure this was Nygaard's or just another one I read about. Regardless, it was a woman who had, was pregnant, was concerned that she'd lose the baby because she had previously lost the baby, and she goes to the psychic to make sure, like, that's not going to happen. And, you know, of course, she was into the psychic for a lot of money to make sure her pregnancy was going to be okay. Uh, she was going to help her somehow with that. But also, oh, guess what? The, the, the person you lost, his soul is burning in some kind of purgatory and he's going to be there forever unless i can do spells to get him out mm. oh. oh that's horrible that's horrible yeah and how and how, so how about this one for just ruining someone's career there was a somebody from south america i want to say brazil medical student in the u.s uh so right going to med school now you can't be too much of a dummy if you went if you're going to a med school right mm -hmm. right off the bat yeah right so this, this right belies the thing of oh, these people are just stupid she got hooked up with the psychic she believed her told her it was a curse on her and her whole entire family and before she was done she had mortgaged her house gave her all the money she had a family inheritance which she gave all to the psychic um she quit med school to become an exotic dancer because that made more money uh, to keep <laughs> giving to the psychic billions of dollars oh wow yeah. Wow. Oh man, that is that is nuts. And and this is what I when I what I talk about that you know if you just if you're an audience you just think this is fun and games to let these TV psychics you know go on and on on every network uh, the Long Island Medium and Thomas John and Tyler Henry and Matt Fraser that even if those people don't rip people off directly because they don't have to they're getting paid by the networks mm -hmm. this is convincing people that this is a real thing mm -hmm. and the little shop on your corner neighborhood the psychic is real. That's the problem. That's yeah. the connection I try to make. And, you know, and, and my conclusion in my article I wrote about this is that all of these people supporting them in the networks and other sources have bloodstains on their hands mm -hmm. and they don't care. Yeah. Yeah. And that'd be helping, uh, yeah, your random psychic, like a local yep. one I've seen at, at some uh, community yep. fairs is yep. Uh, yep. Sheila's Sugar Shack. <laughs> Love it. And it's a psychic shop. Uh, so John Oliver, if people haven't seen this, they can Google this. Uh, John Oliver uh, on his, uh, you know, this week tonight, in back in February, the same last year, just the same time frame that the Thomas John th thing came out in the New York Times, he did an episode on psychics. That's you can just Google it that way, psychics. It was brilliant, and he actually had a few lines in in, in it that I, I excerpted the video and show in my presentation because it was just so good. And one of them was. 
um, you know, what's the connection, like I said, between the media presenting these powers if they're real and everyday people getting ripped off? And he, and he said he said something like, you know, every time a, a psychic makes Dr. Oz cry on TV, a, a street, a, you know, a, a neighborhood psychic gets their wings. <laughs> oh, man, that's funny. Um, well, we are out of time. So if people want to find out more about you or, or more of what you're doing, uh, where can people go? Well, so uh, if you're interested in recovering from religion, you can go to recoveringfromreligion.org. And uh, there's a you know a link there. Contact us. There's even a volunteer tab. Um, that's, that's, you know, most importantly, uh, secondly, I talked about the gorilla skeptics. You can Google gorilla skeptics and Susan Garbick, or just look up Susan Garbick. She's got somewhat of a unique name, G E R B I C mm -hmm. on Facebook. And she'd be glad to talk to you about volunteering for gorilla skepticism on Wikipedia. And, uh, I have a column in skeptical inquirer magazine. As you mentioned, I write as the well-known skeptic. You can just Google that Rob Palmer, uh, the well-known skeptic or skeptical inquirer the well-known skeptic um and i'm on facebook um at the well-known skeptic if you want to follow me and i you know talk about all these sorts of issues including uh, recovering from religion grill skeptics all sorts of paranormal things and uh, uh i'd be happy to have you follow me thank you well i hope you enjoyed the interview uh that was we already covered the feedback there at the beginning but if you want to send us some feedback, you can use the contact form on the website at atheistnomads.com slash contact, or use the speak pipe button to leave us some audio feedback. If you want to support the show, you can find out how at atheistnomads.com slash donate, or just go to Patreon slash atheistnomads. We have a live stream coming up on November 8 at 2 o'clock p.m. Mountain Standard Time. That will be a few days after the election. We may have results on the election by that point and may be in really good moods. Or we might be in the middle of a civil war by that point. So it'll be interesting to see where we're at. <laughs> um, so until next week, remember, not all those who wander are lost. Thank you for listening to another episode of Atheist Nomads. You can find show notes and contact information at atheistnomads.com. Follow us on Twitter at Atheist Nomads and like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash atheistnomads. Please subscribe to the show in iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcatcher of choice. And while you're there, feel free to leave us a review. The music is courtesy of Sturdy Fred. Until next time, this has been the Atheist Nomads.